Hi, I'm Joe Diaguardi, the founder of Truth in Government. Truth in Government is committed to telling you the truth about government spending. And the way that has to be done is to bring principles that have been promulgated in the accounting profession by professionals over the years to government. It's not being done today. And as a result, Congress especially is getting away without the standards that we need to tell you the truth about real government spending. So Truth in Government wants to bring accountability, fiscal responsibility, transparency, the rules that the Security and Exchange Commission imposes on publicly traded companies to the U.S. government. And that will stop the Congress from lying to you about what is really going on with the federal deficits and the national debt. This afternoon, the U.S. House of Representatives voted on the latest revision of the stimulus package. It is expected to go to the Senate tonight. Do we really understand who benefits? Do many people really understand the full scope of the stimulus package? We're joined in the INN studio by former Congressman Joe Diagordi. Former Congressman Diagordi was and is a reformer, and he's also the only congressman who was a certified public accountant when he served. Welcome once again to the INM World Report, Congressman. Thank you, Lenny. Nice to be back on. Just a little correction. I was the only practicing CPA, meaning that I left the accounting profession after 22 years with Arthur Anderson to go to Congress. Nobody else did that at the time. We could sure use you now. What can you tell us about this stimulus package that uh, many people don't understand? M most people still believe that it's only going to benefit Wall Street and not benefit uh, the taxpayer or getting saddled with the bill. Well, listen, I think the good news is that we now have a stimulus package that's going to pass. Whether the components of it are the right balance, no one really knows. But we need to do something right away to create jobs. We got to keep people in their houses. And there is an infrastructure component to this as well. Now, are the infrastructure components, is this pork that people want that we can't get going on because it's not shovel ready, but some congressmen decided they wanted it? That's where we need to have a lot more transparency. I am hoping that when they got this thing back into the conference, that they were able to remove those things that would not be able to be done soon. Because what this economy needs right now is action. You know, let me compare it to an automobile. With no gas, where does the car go? It stays in the garage, right? Well, the economy is the same thing. We need to inject money into this economy so we can get things going. Right now, the jobless rate is uh, going up, uh, the employment rate is going down, and uh, we have big problems. And people are still being foreclosed on. That has to stop. Uh, you know, we had last fall the TARP, the Trouble Asset uh, Re Relief Provisions. I believe that's what they were called. And uh, I think $350 billion was allocated by the Bush administration, but there was another 300 to 350 billion that they said, okay, let the Obama administration uh, put that out. Now, what was the purpose of that? That was basically to put money into the banking systems. As a CPA, it was not done right. People like to talk about accountability. They like to talk about uh, transparency. But to have accountability, you need an accounting system that you can understand. That money should not have been commingled with the other money that the banks had. Because we had to be sure, we had to come up with a system to be sure that our money, the taxpayer's money, was not being paid out for bonuses, not being paid out as dividends, and was not commingled with the normal operating uh, uh, working capital or capital of the bank. It should have been put in a separate account, not a separate corporation, a separate account. So just like a, an attorney on an estate would have a charge and discharge statement, this is the money I have, this is how I spent it, the public would know. And then maybe monthly, we'd have a simple accounting put on the internet, so to speak, so we'd know where this money is. That did not happen. I hope now when Obama puts this in, to have real transparency and accountability, that we have restrictions on the way this money is, is handled. One is, it has to be separately accounted for. Two, uh, there should be a monthly accounting. We should keep this on a short tether so we know where this money is. Uh, that's important because if money doesn't get into the banking system and the banks are not comfortable 
with where they stand on their own capital, and that's what this is supposed to do, make them more comfortable, uh, then they won't lend. And without lending, we don't have the multiplier effect. Uh, small businesses are not getting the loans. Consumer credit is now being threatened. There are many things that are happening. The stimulus bill, on the other hand, is a combination of tax reduction, uh, job incentives, and uh, things like that, infrastructure uh, building, yeah, we also to, to quickly jumpstart the economy. Oh. And that's what we need. And by the way, not that we have the answers to everything, and we are in uncharted waters, so we, to answer your question before, we really don't know what's going to work. But we have to get going and, and do it in such a way that if something doesn't work, we can reverse it immediately. We shouldn't let the car go too far in one direction and waste too much gas before we say, hey, let's head in the other direction. So I think that's important. So let's hope that we now have a combination that's going to work. But the key thing is to get this thing passed and to get the money into the economy so we can get things going and keep people in their houses at the same time. Like the earlier version, this was not this did not have true bipartisan support. We understand that the vote was very was along party lines. What is the kind of uh, what, what are the what are the slow motion effects and what is the pork that you refer to in this version of the bill that the uh, that the GOP is objecting to? What would they like to see more in your understanding that, that uh, would make it work faster, let's say? Well, they wanted to see the bill skewed more towards tax reductions. And as you know, the Democrats would say, we tried that before, that's how we got here. That's what President Bush did. So, you know, they had to come up with a compromise on both sides. Don't forget, there were Republican votes in the Senate. Without those votes, this thing would not have passed. And they did reduce the initial bill from over 900 billion down to something like 820 billion. So there were three Republicans, moderate Republicans, who weighed in and allowed this thing to pass, but they exacted a price for it. And the price was to get additional uh, tax deductions uh, and things like that. So where are those tax I would deductions say that, going? Uh, what are, who are those well, tax deductions going to? Uh, apparently, according to the, the Bush, what he wanted, excuse me, Obama, the new president, <laughs> uh, it was basically the middle classes that were going to get the, the tax benefits from this bill and that uh, the, the tax, tax implications or tax assessments would go more towards the people that had the money to pay, but he said on balance the net thing is that there would be a tax reduction. I think they may have reached the right balance on that. No one really knows. But they're saying that the, the objections from the GOP were basically for educational and, and things that would stimulate, uh, let's say, personal growth or, or, or making a better society. Those are the things we understand were stripped out of it. What's your opinion on that? Well, I hope that they left enough in there for the states because you do need a state component to this bill, and I believe a lot of money was left in to take care of the states' education, Medicaid, uh, and, and, and other, other things because the states now are bleeding. Look at New York State. New York State is underwater in one year, $14 billion, and over the next three years, they say something like $50 billion. Without some input from the federal government, uh, services will have to be cut back dramatically. And that's not to say we shouldn't be looking at state government where there are multiple levels of government. I think we, start, we have to start looking at some consolidation. For instance, my own county, Westchester County, every town, village, municipality has a police force. Is that efficient? And, and the county has one besides. And you have the state troopers besides. I think we have to start looking at the way we can start consolidating without losing the quality of service to the tax. Uh, we have to do that. Now, this money, how is it going to be distributed? Does it get handed directly to the states? Does it get handed directly to the banks? How is the, what is the breakdown of the distribution? Well, if we're talking about the trouble asset program, which is going to be converted to another name when Obama puts his half out, that is going to the banks. We know that. And we need to have a separate system of accounting, accountability, and transparency to be sure that the banks are not paying bonuses, are not paying dividends, and they're getting it out immediately. That's the responsibility there. On the stimulus plan, there's multiple things. The states are getting uh, chunks of money. Uh, and, now, are those and, chunks and of money going to be divided up between individual state need? Is it going to be so much per state? How do you believe it's going to be handed out? I think it's going to be on the basis of the Congress people where they're representing their states, making their cases as to which states need it, need, need it most. So it's, it's not a blanket number, uh, uh, you know, half a trillion dollars to here and a quarter trillion dollars to I don't to think there. so, but I do believe that they know at this point how much New York State's going to get approximately and other states, and it would be the states that really need it that will get that money. Uh, but don't forget, you also have the tax 
uh, rebate component. Some people are going to get checks in the mail. That's an immediate stim stimulus. Uh, some people who haven't paid taxes will get a check instead of a, a deduction on their tax return. So there's an immediate injection of funds into the economy, hopefully to people who will immediately spend that money. And that money will then be multiplied. Uh, others will get tax deductions uh, besides uh, you know, some kind of a, an immediate uh, tax credit or a, a check. So I think the balance is that we're moving the money away from the government, but right now the government, and I hate to say it because I'm considered a conservative Republican, the government is absolutely needed. Everything else has failed, and without the government intervention at this point, things are going to go from bad to worse because there's a, a lack of confidence. And when there's a lack of confidence, we've seen in the past what happens. People don't spend. And when people don't spend, a lot of other things go wrong. People lose their jobs, as you know, and that's happening. This money comes from the taxpayer. How much per taxpayer to pay for this? A lot. In fact, in my book, Unaccountable Congress, I had to make the case that really, and this was 1992, and boy, did I point the way to what's happening right now, because in chapter, I think it was chapter five, I said, the Big Apple and Washington, one bailout after the other because of the congressional credit card. I put the congressman's voting card, in effect, on the front of the book. It's the same size as a credit card, and I called it, Lenny, the most expensive credit card in the world because we were spending money we didn't have. We're, in those days, we were borrowing from Japan. Now we have over $2 trillion just from Japan and China, and they need their own money. So how much longer are they going to lend us money? And when they don't lend us money, how much more money can they F the Fed print until we get into a point where we might be setting the stage for big inflation, stagflation. You remember Jimmy Carter, 21%? Uh, prime rate at one point, and we had you know, inflation and stagnation at the same time. Uh, I hope that doesn't come back, but that's why this thing was fine-tuned, hopefully, by the House and Senate in conference so that it, it keeps us on that track. But think about what's going on here. It's not just the top money of $700, $800 billion and the stimulus of $800 billion. You've got the Fed putting out a couple of trillion dollars expanding the money supply so that you know, people will be able to, to borrow. And they've done that you know, while we're sleeping. So what happens is, if we don't begin to account for these things properly and retrench at some time, point and start saving, we could be in a situation where the economy starts coming back, interest rates are too low, there's too much money, and what happens? Inflation goes through the ceiling. And that happened once before. So we have to fine tune this system and keep it under a short leash. And accountability, I'm an accountant, is a very important part of that. Well, we don't know how much lower that interest rates can go, and we certainly don't hope that China pulls in its marker. But let me ask you this. The way well, they the can't go any lower. Can't go any lower. You know that. Interest rates have been used to the maximum extent, and the Federal Reserve has already put a lot of money out there. So now well, the only also, hope, Joe, and have, that's the monetary system. Now we're going back to the fiscal system, the budgetary process. That's a different part of it, taxing and spending. And let's hope now that the combination of the two will jumpstart this economy. I know that these interest rates for people that live off their portfolios, I know that these interest rates are, are certainly hurting people that use that as part of their income, but... Yeah, but they have safety now. If they, if they have no interest on a Treasury bill or a small amount, they at least know that the money is not going to be halved the way it was in the stock market. And that's really what's happened here. A lot of people have left the market to seek safety because there's so much uncertainty, and that's what happens when there's a lot of uncertainty. Let's talk about a doomsday report for a moment. You mentioned the need for speed. If uh, this plan is uh, implemented very slowly or for some reason it gets uh, tangled up a little further in Congress, what is the time frame you say this needs to be put in action before things get worse? What is the time frame? Immediately. I mean, the, the Obama... But what admin, happens if it doesn't? Well, it will. The Obama administration has put together its cabinet. You know, sorry to see that uh, Judge Gregg today decided not to become part of... He's not the Secretary of Commerce, so there's another setback. But uh, we have a cabinet, we have a president who's going around, he's using the bully pulpit, uh, running around America trying to get the people involved, wake them up, uh, but he's also now, he has the confidence of the people. He has to go back to Washington and make sure that this system now gets implemented. And that's, a, in good part, this bill was passed because he stayed with it, went around the country, and they saw that he was you know, being a leader at this point. Joe Diagordi, thank you for being on the International News Net one more time.
The Dow has closed down another 350 points today as the federal government stepped in to rescue AIG insurance just two days after Lehman bellies up and Bank of America grabs Merrill Lynch in distress. Normal headlines? Well, how did we get here? Our next guest has some insight into the current crisis. Former Congressman Joe DiAguardia from New York became the first practicing certified public accountant elected to the U.S. Congress. He was a partner with the international accounting firm of Arthur Anderson and & Company. And since leaving Congress in 1989, Joe has established the nonpartisan foundation Truth in Government, which advocates federal fiscal reforms. He is also the author of Unaccountable Congress. It doesn't add up. Welcome to Iron Hand, Joe. Thank you for having me, Lenny. Joe, today you had a letter to the editor published in the New York Times about the real cost of government. Can we begin here? Sure. First one, actually, I've tried many times to get a letter in, but it looks like they're finally getting interesting in accounting issues now that things are starting to uh, uh, collapse. And the, uh, the reason for that is that I wanted to take this opportunity to tell the public, as I have through the book and the Foundation Truth in Government, that there's a double standard. Washington does not use the accounting system that it imposes on the private sector through the Securities and Exchange Commission. In other words, if you want to sell stock, you have a kind of uh, rigid professional accounting system called the accrual basis of accounting, generally accepted accounting principles. You need an audit from an accounting firm. Well, you can't do, any, you can't do anything in the markets without that. Why? They want to protect the shareholders, the people who invest in America. So I'm saying in my book, Who's protecting the taxpayers when the government is using a Mickey Mouse accounting system, which is a shell game? It's called the cash basis. And when the Times, when I wrote this response to their editorial Sunday, because they were saying in this editorial, how is it with the collapse of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the bailout of Bear Stearns, government is saying there's no impact on the budget deficit. So I wrote a letter saying there absolutely is. But under their Mickey Mouse illegal accounting system, they don't reflect it because everything seems to be off the books when it comes to estimating the, the losses on certain things. It's not like banks have to do. So basically, they called me back. They said, well, this sounds kind of outrageous that you're saying this is illegal. We need proof of this. So I gave them the site, the public law. Believe it or not, in 56, 1956, the second Hoover Commission issued its report. Eisenhower signed it. The first one was signed by Truman requiring the federal government to go on the right accounting system and gave Congress five years. They never did it. And that's where we stand today. That's why this is an issue. Now, not many accountants run for Congress. I'm the only practicing CPA, believe it or not. And maybe we need a few more. But even if you had, I'm not sure that would change it. We need the public to understand this issue and say, hey, if it's good enough for us and you're imposing on us through the SEC, then we want you to account for our tax dollars the same way. We've heard so many stories about the Government Accountability Office, let's just say, losing a lot of money. Let's talk for a minute about government-sponsored enterprises. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are just two of 29, we understand. Yeah. Tell us about some of the others and how that, uh, how that system is really uh, working. You know, well, these are called the so-called GSEs, using the Washington acronym. But basically, what they are are the special purpose entities, and we already heard that before, with the Enron debacle. When Enron went to court because they were fraudulently showing higher earnings and a lower debt, how did that happen? Because the accountants, and in a way my old firm, Arthur Anderson, uh, didn't see the whole picture at that time and they got caught in that mess. The accountants, what they were doing, and the management, they were putting things off the books in order to make the Enron accounting look better. So therefore, it was much worse than they knew until the end and things started to collapse. That's what's happening now. You know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac just didn't collapse overnight. They, they're using an accounting system which is basically geared to the cash basis and basically these government sponsored enterprises are off the books or off the budget. So it's only when there's a big catastrophe requiring a bailout that you start hearing about this because then they want to go and the taxpayers have to come up with the money. They did this in 1988 with the Resolution Trust Corporation when you had the SNL crisis. This is a repeat of that. In fact, it may be even more with these subprime 
uh, mortgages, which they have not yet fully measured. So basically what you have are entities which are off the budget, you might say off the books of the United States of America, yet they're able to float bonds. And people would say, if you ask them, ah, well, yeah, people are buying the bonds because they think the government is backing them up, but that's an implicit guarantee. And in my book on page 47, I said, wait a minute, implicit guarantee? If these things go under, you bet your bottom dollar that the government is going to have to stand behind them. And look what we found. China has billions of dollars of these Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac bonds, and you could not walk away from them. So in effect, the government did bail out these entities, but they're still off the books like the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. Now, what's important about that one? When a company goes under, they transfer their pension obligation to this agency, which has a good social purpose, because you want to continue to give workers some of their pension. But that entity doesn't use the right accounting. And right now, if you put it on the right accounting basis, you'd find out that there is a lot of debt that we're not recording that someday we're going to pay somebody when they retire. Now, like Social Security, by the way. This problem, it is, you talk about the federal government, this also carries over into the states. And, and uh, this is also going to be a problem concerning pensions at a state level. We understand New York and, and Albany are certainly right. dealing a lot with this. Tell us. But let's tell talk us about, about New York. Yeah, right let's here. talk about New York. We're New here. New York is, is a real problem. Look, the politics is so right now skewed up and, and, and confused and manipulated, and nothing's changed. Here's the governor trying to do the right thing, covering to try to cover a $6 billion shortfall in the budget. He said, you're going to have a special section session of, of, of the legislature, brought him back August the 19th. Don't forget, this is a part-time legislature. They go out on June 30th. And to try to cut a billion, 600 million, he can only get them to cut 400 million. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you we're going to have to borrow a lot more money. But guess what that's done to New York State? We're now number 49 in terms of the worst bond ratings in America, 49 out of 50 states. Now, it's not only because of the budget deficit. Guess what else we have? What Washington has with these government-sponsored enterprises, what Enron had, it's called special purpose entities. We have them, too, in New York State. They're called authorities. We have 600 authorities off the books. Many of them are small Mickey Mouse, don't add up to anything, but you've got some big ones. Metropoli uh, the Metropolitan Transit Authority, the Power Authority. Now, many times when these politicians decide they want to find a nice place to put their friends, they give them a job, the Battery Park Apartment Authority. There's, a, there's one of the authorities. Look at some of the salaries being paid to some of these old Pataki guys, and I'm sure the Democrats did the same thing. You're talking 150, 200,000. Why do they end up with those nice big salaries there? Because they know they're only going to be there for a few years. But guess how they calculate the pensions in New York State? It's the average of your highest three years. So they build up this nice big salary base. Now they get a lifelong pension, which they never would have been entitled to before. Worse than that, look what happened in Yonkers lately. Detectives, overtime, $100,000 on top of a base salary of 120, 25. Why? because someone is letting them work in the last three years to build up the pension. Now, that, that goes somewhere into the pension obligations of the state. Now, it's a very complicated mess, but what's wrong with picking up the accounting system that the SEC requires business to use in order for you to sell your stock or your bonds to the public? If we can protect the public, the shareholders, the investing public, we have to protect the taxpayers too. Before we have to go, you've written about the need for a capital budget in Washington. Tell us a little about that. Well, here's another interesting thing, uh, and I point that out in the book in an article I wrote recently that appeared in Gannett, and I wish more papers would pick it up. Uh, and I sent this to both campaigns, by the way. It's very important because 37 states have a capital budget. Every corporation in America that sells shares has a capital budget. Washington doesn't have one. What's a capital budget? Capital budget is to project and prepare for the expenditures for assets. For instance, if I have an aircraft carrier that's going to cost a billion dollars, that's an asset. Now, it might go down tomorrow in a war, but at least you've got to put it on the book as an asset until you lose it. What does Washington do? Out of the almost $3 trillion we're going to spend next year, this is next year's budget, $500 billion are on those kinds of things, buildings 
uh, big equipment. I'm not talking about putting bullets on the books of assets, but capital type items. And yet, they go right into the budget deficit. A capital budget would say, hey, these are assets. Put them on the books as an asset, float the bonds as infrastructure bonds, and pay those bonds off over the life of those assets. And what does this do? It's good social accounting. Why? Because now you're spreading the cost of these things over several generations. Who's benefiting from it? But the way they do it right now, it hits only this generation, gets put into the budget deficit, and it gives, and I saw this in Congress, Lenny, it gives the people who are now in charge of these assets the idea, oh, these are already written off. Maybe next year I can sell it and bring it back in as cash so it looks like I'm making money on a cash basis for my next uh, you know, budget uh, to impress my friends. Hey, this is big money when you're talking about $500 billion a year. Let's put it on the books. And why is this good? We have to rebuild America. The infrastructure problems in America. Why did I write that article last year? I wrote it the day after the bridge came down in Minneapolis because I heard there could be another thousand bridges around America that are deficient. The engineers were saying this. So let's rebuild America. And what does this do? Puts people back to work when the economy is bad. Who did this? A great Democrat, FDR, and a great Republican, Eisenhower. They rebuilt the infrastructure of America the roads, the electrical system. Let's do it, and let's not be afraid to spend. I'm a fiscal conservative, all right? And I'm telling you, let's not be afraid to spend, but don't put it in as an expense. Put it on the books as an asset, and let's then pay that bond off over the useful life. You know what some people are saying now? Oh, we gotta sell the throughway or the, or the Triborough Bridge or something to a private corporation. Well, I, let, me, let me interrupt you there. Are you an advocate of privatizing everything that isn't nailed down, which seems to have been the model of this administration going Absol back to the Reagan administration no, also. Absolutely not. There are things that are so important for the public. And to become a hostage to a corporation that wants to maximize its bottom line when you need to get to work, and now you don't know if they're going to raise the, 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 the tolls, you know, beyond a certain amount, that's not right. No. There are certain things maybe you can privatize. But the infrastructure of America to get to work, uh, the waterways, things that are so important, uh, I can't see government giving that license up to the private sector. Tell us where people can get the book. Good. Well, the book is not for sale. I give it out for nothing. I feel this is my moral obligation as a former congressman uh, who you know, also was a certified public accountant. It's a rare combination. Uh, but if anybody wants it, they can write to me, Joe Diaguardi, or Truth in Government, and it's easy. P.O. Box 70, Ossining, New York. Unaccountable Congress. Unaccountable Congress. Unaccountable Congress. It doesn't add up. Notice what's on the cover, a credit card. I used a congressman's voting card, which is shaped just like a Visa card, and I said this is the most expensive credit card in the world, because every time a congressman uses it in the computer terminal, we're increasing the deficit and the national debt. Joe Diaguardia, thank you so much for joining us My in pleasure. the studio here in New York.